Hi guys, today we're going to be discussing the Paleozoic era. Last time we discussed the Precambrian, and now we're moving into the Phanerozoic Eon, which includes the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras. So we're starting with the Paleozoic. First, I want to start by reminding everyone where we left off. Basically, we talked about the Great Oxidation State in the early Proterozoic, and we talked about the beginning of the formation of Gondwana, a large supercontinent, at the end of the Proterozoic, right before we moved into the Paleozoic. Then we mentioned that right when we get into the Paleozoic, we see the Cambrian explosion, which is an explosion of life that happened early in the Paleozoic, and then from then on, life just diversified. So we're going to talk about life, but first in today's lecture, we're going to talk about a little bit of geology, some tectonics, some orogenies or mountain building events, and some paleogeography. So let's get started. First, let me give you some context. We talked about the Precambrian last time, which goes from 4.5 billion years ago to 542 million years ago. So that accounted for a lot of Earth's history. As we can see on this slide, the Precambrian takes up most of the room, and that's why. So the Paleozoic went from 542 million years ago, right after the Precambrian, to around 251 million years ago. And this era included the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian periods. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about these when we get to the life, and we're going to mention period-specific events that happen. So I'm going to try and give you guys a way to remember the order of these periods. How I remember it is this mnemonic, come over someday, maybe play poker. My geologist mom taught me that. So that is how I remember it. You can make up any sentence you want that could fit those words, and that'll probably help you remember it better. So getting into the tectonics a little bit, we're going to talk about some orogenic events or mountain building events that helped create our three main mobile belts that we see in North America today. And these include the Appalachian mobile belt, the Wachita mobile belt, and the Cordilleran mobile belt. And so these were formed by the Taconic orogeny, Acadian orogeny, Alleghenian orogeny, don't know if I'm saying that right, but it happened, the Wachita orogeny, the Antler orogeny, and the Sonoma orogeny, respectively. And so we'll talk about a little bit of the timing of these orogenies and exactly what kind of plate tectonics caused those mountains to build. So we left off in the Precambrian, seeing that Gondwana, a large supercontinent, had just started forming. And this is this large blob in the lower right corner of the globe here on the right. This supercontinent began to form at around 550 million years ago, which is where we left off the late Proterozoic Eon, and now we are moving into the Cambrian period of the Paleozoic era. And in this period, Gondwana continued to grow, and a few other really important continental masses, such as Laurentia, Baltica, Siberia, and Kazakhstania, included the modern-day countries and continents listed next to each one of them. Now, for simplicity purposes and just to understand the orogenies I mentioned earlier, we're only going to focus on three of these continents, Gondwana, Laurentia, and Baltica, which are highlighted here in yellow, orange, and pink, respectively. These continents started as separate continental masses coexisting with an ocean in between them called Ipetus Ocean. And we can also see the Siberia continent here too. But for now, let's just focus on Laurentia and Baltica, because those two are going to be important for what we're going to see happens between the Cambrian and the Devonian. So remember, the Cambrian was about 542 million years ago to 490 million years ago. So from then to the Devonian, around 420 to 300. 50 million years ago, Laurentia and Baltica were able to close the Ipetus Ocean and in doing so collided with each other, forming Laurasia. Now there's only Laurasia and Gondwana. So these are the two main continental masses during the Devonian. And then after the Devonian, in between 350 million years ago and around 290 to 250 million years ago, Pangaea was able to form. Now there's a lot of intricate details of the continental shifting that went on in between the Cambrian to the Permian. However, I'm only focusing on these three main shifts because what we had is the closing of the Ipetus Ocean, causing Laurasia to form from the Laurentia and Baltica collision, which caused the formation, if you remember from the last slide, of the Raic Ocean, which then closed when those two combined to form Pangaea, and this caused another continental continental collision. And each time these oceans close is really important because then when the continents collide, it forms an orogenic event or mountain building event. And 
so for example, the taconic orogeny that we talked about earlier, that was the first stage of the Appalachian Belt formation, that started because Ipenosotian began to subduct. And then once it totally closed and there was the continental continental collision of Laurentia and Baltica, that caused the second stage of the Appalachian Belt formation, which was called the Acadian orogeny. Then Laurasia was formed, which then collided with Gondwana, closing the Rayak Ocean, which caused the third stage of the Appalachian Belt development, and this was called the Alleghenian, I think I'm saying that right, orogeny. Now, Laurasia and Gondwana were engaged in continental-continental collision events in multiple stages, and a later stage of this continental collision caused the formation of the Wachita Mobile Belt in the aptly named Wachita Orogeny, or Mountain Building Event. And as for our last mobile belt we discussed, we mentioned the Cordilleran Mobile Belt, which is now located on the western side of North America, and this mobile belt was created in two orogenic events, the Antler and Sonoma, which were ocean-ocean subduction events and ocean-continent subduction events, respectively. So not necessarily continent-continent collisions, just as the Appalachians and Wachita mobile belts were formed. So now that we have that cleared up, I also have on this slide that the formation of Pangaea had profound effects on global climate and living organisms, and we'll talk about this later when we get to the mass extinction that occurred during this era. But first, let's do a quick review over the geologic events that we just went over that occurred in the Paleozoic era. So this is a picture I showed you at the beginning where we left off from the Precambrian. We have the beginning of Gondwana formation, Great Oxidation, and Cambrian Explosion, which we'll take completely off right now because we're only going to talk about those again when we get to the life portion of this video. But for the geologic event portion, let's first expand this portion, the Paleozoic era portion, shown here. And now I still have the beginning of the Gondwana formation listed here. So you can look at that for reference, and that happened in the Neoproterozoic, which is right before the Cambrian. So going from right to left, as we go older to younger, let's start with each event we just went over. First, we had Gondwana, Laurentia, and Baltica coexisting. Then we had the Ipenis Ocean closing, causing the Taconic Orogeny, or the first stage of development of Appalachian Mountains. Then we had Laurentia and Baltica collide in the Acadian Orogeny. And then we had Laurasia form as a result. And then we had the Rayak Ocean close as Gondwana and Laurasia collided. And then we had Allegheny and Wachita Orogenies as a result of this continental collision. And then we had Pangaea form. Now for purposes of simplicity and just talking about how Pangaea formed, I didn't really have Cordier and Mobile Belt development stages on here just because I didn't really have room. However, keep in mind that it was also occurring during the Paleozoic era. However, also keep in mind that the continental collisions were important for forming the supercontinent. Now that we have that out of the way, we can move on and say, okay, enough with the rocks. What about the life? So Paleozoic life. First, like we said earlier, we had the Cambrian explosion. This was an explosion of more complex and diverse organisms. And this was also when the first organisms with hard parts appeared, which if you watch my fossil preservation video, you know that hard parts and rapid burial are the most important things for preservation potential or being preserved good. And so we're very happy that hard parts showed up because we have a very extensive fossil record from this point on. However, this is not to say that soft-bodied organisms went extinct. They were still around and they were still abundant. The hard part organisms did not take the place of soft-bodied organisms. They just branched out a little more. So let's go through this in stages. First, I'll start with the early Paleozoic life. I'll talk about the invertebrates, the plants, and the vertebrates. Then I'll talk about mid Paleozoic and then late Paleozoic accordingly. So we had mostly marine organisms throughout invertebrates, vertebrates, and plants all the way until the late Ordovician. And some of these marine invertebrates and in early Paleozoic included archaeocyathids, which were very short-lived. They only lived during the early Paleozoic, so they provide us very good index fossils. And we also had trilobites evolved, which are also very good index fossils for the entire Paleozoic because they have very distinct morphologies for each period of the Paleozoic. Additionally, we had brachiopods, nautiloids, graptolites, dermatoporoids, tabulate corals, and stromatolites. You may recognize stromatolites here because I talk about it in the Precambrian. This is about the only organism listed here that was also in the Precambrian. Most of these just appeared in the Cambrian. And these are important because a lot of them were really important for the ecosystems, especially such organisms as reef builders, like the corals or the stromatoporoids or the sponges or even mollusks. So you have to remember that these invertebrates can't just be brushed off. They are very important for the entire marine ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems as a whole. Next, we'll talk about early Paleozoic plants. We had photosynthesizing cyanobacteria in the Precambrian, which we talked about was the reason 
reason why we have the great oxidation event and the late Neoproterozoic oxidation event, which was likely the cause or at least linked to the Cambrian explosion. And so what happened to these cyanobacteria? Well, the cyanobacteria still existed. They were a little bit less abundant after all the other organisms kind of took over a lot of Earth. However, they actually, in a way, became incredibly diverse because they put a little bit of themselves in every plant that came after them. What I mean by this is that a eukaryotic cell that eventually evolved into the first plant cell long ago once swallowed a cyanobacterial cell. Eventually, this caused their symbiotic relationship in which the cyanobacteria evolved to act as the cell's chloroplast, causing that eukaryote to be able to perform photosynthesis. And this caused the evolution of all plants, which is pretty freaking cool. They basically have a bacteria inside them. Now, it's evolved to function as part of the eukaryotic cell now. It's not necessarily like a microbiome. It doesn't act independently, but it once was its own organism. So I just think that's really cool. Now, moving on to a little bit later in the early Paleozoic, we have the late Ordovician, which marked the first appearance of land plants, at least in our fossil record. Moving on to vertebrates. In terms of vertebrates for the early Paleozoic, we have conodonts, which is this weird looking uh, lamprey-like animal to the left. However, they're not still around. They're extinct now. Conodonts were only around from the Cambrian to the Devonian, making them incredibly good index fossils. However, they were not preserved in body fossils. They were actually preserved as just their teeth. Their teeth were pretty much the only thing that ever preserved. We actually went a long time without knowing what this animal looked like. It took a lot of time to actually find a body preserved of this animal, but basically the teeth look like this, and you can see they're really, really tiny. This is only 0.5 millimeter scale, and additionally, we also had jawless fish show up in the Ordovician to the Devonian, and both of these time scales are pretty short, which means both of these make really good index fossils. Moving on to the Middle Paleozoic, we have invertebrates such as echinoderms, rugose corals, bryozoans, sponges, eurypterids, new species of stromatoporoids, tabulate corals, and brachiopods. And something interesting to point out for mid-Paleozoic invertebrates is that eurypterids were invertebrate predators. Now, there weren't many invertebrates, and there still aren't many invertebrates that get very big and actually practice predation. However, the eurypterids were pretty dang terrifying. If you just imagine swimming in the ocean and you come upon an eight-foot-long sea scorpion, that's what it would be like swimming in the mid-Paleozoic sea, because that's what eurypterids were. And i just glad that they're not still around. And since they were only abundant in the mid-Paleozoic, they also make great index fossils. Now, in terms of plants, we have non-vascular plants that dominated in the early Paleozoic. However, by the late Silurian, vascular plants evolved. This was really important because non-vascular plants don't have roots or tissues that can transport water throughout the body of the plant, meaning the vascular plants were able to move further away from water bodies and still live. They could pull groundwater up from their roots. They could pull rainwater up. They wouldn't die if they moved away from a water body. So they could take advantage of some niches on land that hadn't been taken advantage of yet. Also, seed plants called gymnosperms evolved by the late Devonian, which also helped their proliferation and diversification. In terms of vertebrates, we had the jawed fish take over in the Devonian, and therefore the jawless fish were left to go extinct. However, I want to point out that this is an instance that is typically not seen in evolution. I point out in my evolution and phylogeny video that evolution is not linear, meaning when one thing evolves into another, that doesn't mean the first thing goes extinct. It's typically a branching event, not a linear event. However, in this case, the jawless fish, which evolved into the jawed fish, did go extinct. Not right away. It wasn't linear. There was branching. They did coexist for a while, but the jawless fish were just not able to keep up, and so they went extinct by the end of the Devonian, and the jawed fish just took over. And that's why the Devonian is typically known as the age of fish. And additionally, in the late Devonian, the first first land tetrapod had evolved, which is incredibly huge for our purposes in terms of being land tetrapods ourselves. I mean, we got two arms, two legs, and so, yeah, this was an important event. And this first land tetrapod was a lobed fin fish that started to walk on land, and he was named Tiktaalik, and is shown here to the right. Moving on to the late Paleozoic, in terms of invertebrates, echinoderms, bryozoans, and brachiopods continue to stay abundant, and additionally, we had a new type of foreign Manifera. I didn't mention Foraminifera that much earlier in the Paleozoic just because they're microfossils, they're not really big invertebrates, not a lot of people know about them, but they have been around since the Cambrian, and they're microfossils that 
form an abundance of diverse morphologies that we can use to our advantage when studying past environment and climate and using them as index fossils. For example, the fusilinids, which were only around from the Mississippian to the Permian, or in this time scale shown here, the Carboniferous to Permian, they have a really short time range, and so therefore they make really good index fossils. And these guys look a little bit like little tiny rice grains, and I'll show you a picture in a later slide when we talk about index fossils, but they have really distinct morphologies in the Mississippi and Pennsylvania and Permian respectively. Therefore, we can tell pretty much exactly where we are in the rock record when we find these guys in the rocks that we're looking at. Additionally, they not only had a short time range, but they were incredibly geographically widespread, which is another really awesome thing when we want to have an index fossil. Geographically widespread index fossils means that we can correlate rocks around the world from that age. Additionally, when we look at late Paleozoic vertebrates, we have incredible steps in evolution that went on during the late Paleozoic. Like I said, we have the lobed fin fish come onto land forming early amphibians. However, they still had to stay near the water because of the ways that fish and amphibians lay their eggs in a gelatinous-like coating, which limits how far they can go into land. However, by the Mississippian or the early Carboniferous, we have the evolution of the amniotic egg occur. And this was really important because amniotic eggs are coated with a hard coating that allows the organisms to move further onto land to lay their eggs that will keep them moist, they won't dry out, they'll be protected, and therefore we can proliferate new environments that are not yet taken advantage of. Additionally, from the evolution of these amniotic eggs, we have the diversification of amphibians into very different tetrapods that were called anapsids, synapsids, and diapsids, respectively. And they became so different as they went off and diversified in their crazy different environments on land that they became totally different than amphibians. And they're actually the ancestors of all the rest of the groups of the vertebrates. So we already talked about fish and amphibians, but anapsids, synapsids, and diapsids are the ancestors of reptiles, mammals, and birds. Not respectively, though. So I'm going to get to which ones represent which in a second. Before I get to that, let me just point out that when these guys first evolved, they were pretty much only differentiated by their skull structures. From then on, they started becoming much more distinguished from each other, but this was the first major difference, and then they became more and more different after that. So the anapsids, as shown here on the left side of the skull picture, in modern day have evolved to form reptile tetrapods such as turtles. Next, diapsids, which are shown here to the right of the skull picture. These went on to form modern day snakes, crocodiles, lizards, and birds. These are all really different organisms, so you know that these guys had to do some major diversification, which they did, but we'll talk about that in later videos over the Mesozoic and Cenozoic evolution. Moving on to synapsids, these guys were really important, and when I say that, I mean these guys eventually evolved into things that became mammals, and that's why I'm focusing more on them. <laughs> we always tend to focus on what became us. With that said, <laughs> this guy is shown here in this picture. This is just one of the groups of organisms that the synapsids included, which is called the plesiosaur or sailback synapsid. And they also went on to further evolve into a more advanced type of synapsid called a Therapsid. An advanced branch of synapsids with differentiated teeth, powerful forelimbs, and characteristic mammal-like jaws and skull structures. And a certain type of therapsid went on to evolve into a cynodont, which pictured here had all those characteristics. And this is the type of therapsid that was able to survive the Permian extinction event, which will become important when I talk about it on the next slide because it was a major extinction event that wiped out a lot of animals. So the survival of this little guy basically paved the way for mammal evolution as a whole. Now let's move on to the thing I know you've all been waiting for, the extinction. The end Permian extinction or Permo-Triassic extinction marks the greatest extinction in Earth's history. And when I say greatest, it doesn't mean great in the way we typically use the word. It means largest, most detrimental, just insane, lots of dying things. This was caused by a lot of things which we'll get into in a later slide. However, before we get to that, I'll just mention that it did cause 95% of marine invertebrates and 50% of terrestrial vertebrates to go extinct. So on a happier note, 
let's just quickly review what we just went over in terms of Paleozoic life. Just some major events on this time scale that we showed earlier, which is the expanded view of the Paleozoic era. I have here the Cambrian explosion and the Permo-Triassic extinction capping this era. And so first we had the first vertebrates show up in the Cambrian, the first land plants in the Ordovician, the Ordovician extinction, Permo-Triassic extinction wasn't the only extinction. There was also an Ordovician and Devonian extinction. Then we had the first jawfish, the first insects and seed plants, the Devonian extinction, which I just mentioned, the first land vertebrates, the first reptiles, the first winged insects, and now we get to index fossils. This isn't really major events during the Paleozoic, but it is something I wanted to put on this time scale and reiterate in terms of main index fossils you guys should probably be aware of that mark certain periods in the Paleozoic era. For example, in the early Paleozoic on the right, we have trilobites, brachiopods, nautiloids, and graptolites, and something I forgot to list here, but is very important, are archaeocyathids. In the mid-Paleozoic, we have crinoids, we have blastoids, rugose corals, bryozoans, sponges, and eurypterids. See, I told you, isn't that a terrifying sea scorpion? Just imagine that eight feet long. Anyway, then we have the late Paleozoic index fossils, which there are some more, but the main one is fusilinids, which look like little tiny footballs or rice grains. And there isn't a scale on this picture, but basically if you cut a really thin slice of this rock and look at it on a microscope, it looks like this. And this is only a one millimeter scale. So now you have some idea about how micro these microfossils are. Now, moving on to the last thing we'll discuss in this video, the Permatriassic extinction. I introduced it earlier, but basically it is the greatest extinction in Earth's history, marked by this huge dip in biodiversity here on this graph. And in terms of possible causes, we have volcanic eruption, basically a volcanic eruption lasting 1 million years. Just think about that for a second. A volcanic eruption lasting 1 million years over 2 million square miles. This thing was huge. This was a huge source of CO2 to the atmosphere causing global warming and therefore oxygen level drop in the ocean as well as ocean acidification. Additionally, this warming would have caused the the melting of frozen methane hydrates causing more warming because it increases the greenhouse effect. And we had the formation of Pangaea, which causes drastic change in ocean circulation and climate just because of the pure fact that it's a supercontinent. And the ocean's configuration and continental configurations can cause huge differences in climate due to circulation changes and mountain building events and just huge climate patterns that change. I mean, either direction, warming, cooling can really cause some damage to the life because they're not ready for a drastic change. So anyway, any one of these things, or more likely all of these things together, were to blame for the Permatriassic extinction. Okay, that is all I have for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned something about the Paleozoic era, the geologic events that went on during this era, the evolutionary events that went on during this era, and if you think I missed anything or should go over anything in this video in more detail, please leave a comment and I will be happy to make another video with whatever you'd like me to elaborate on. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Bye!